So, welcome everyone. Uh, we are in the, in the second talk for today. And as you may know, modern software development is not only about writing the code, it's mostly about the distribution, dividing your software and how to make it work uh, across all the different devices. So our next speaker, Alexander Makarov, will talk about this stuff. He's from Asapiril, but he's famous not only for that. So please welcome Alexander Makarov. All right. Uh, first of all, but of this, всем привет. Hello. Uh, so the talk is called Theory of Programming Packaging Principles. And first of all, uh, a bit about myself. Thank you for introduction, but as uh, was said, I, I'm uh, kind of famous not for my uh, commercial work, but for, for the open source. So I'm a maintainer of the E framework and currently the lead of the project. And the framework is quite a big one in the PHP and we are making the third version. So uh, uh, this talk emerged because this third version is divided into packages heavily. There are 200 plus packages and we were needed a good way to actually divide these packages, uh, make the boundaries, etc. So, uh, what's the plan, the current plan? We'll talk about packages, we'll talk about principles and first of all, disclaimer, in order to apply any principles correctly, uh, you need to understand them. Without understanding any principle applied leads to total disaster. Always. So, let's begin from the very, very basics. And the basics is about abstraction. Abstraction is a generalization of essential and removal of non-essential. And these essential and non-essential are in the context, in the context of our model, in the context of the project we are actually implementing. And what is it all for? What we, uh, what we need abstraction for? Uh, it is to fit unfitable. So we can uh, fit everything into what? Into, well, this thing, our brain. The source of all our <laughs> problems. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the brain has a thing called short-term memory that's not really accurate. I'm not a biologist, but that's vaguely resembles on how it works. So the short-term memory is uh, a storage, a storage with items, and some items go in, some items go out, and there is a TTL of the item. By default, it's about 20 seconds, and, well, what, what get in the brain, in the short-term memory, gets out automatically in like 20 seconds. We can uh, focus and hold it, we can uh, repeat it, concentrate, and hold it there, but it requires significant energy. And, well, it's not easy to keep lots of items in the short-term memory. So uh, there were uh, research, and this the research displayed that uh, in 1989, it was like uh, we can hold in our short-term memory about seven plus minus two items. That's not much, but well, whatever. Uh, and in 2001, it was updated and it drastically reduced, either because of the research was better or something like that, but it's four plus minus one item. We're good with abstractions, so I assume we can do this plus one, so that's like five items. That's what we can hold in our brains easily. Afterwards, it becomes harder and harder and uh, the cognitive complexity increases. So the number actually depends on the items. So uh, there is a trick, we can chunk things. So for example, uh, this phone number, try to remember it. Done? Okay. Do you still remember it? Really? All whole number? No. And if we'll do it like this, that will be much, much easier, right? Easy? No? 
not easy, but well, it's it's at least doable. So if we'll uh, get back to this, there's exactly one, two, three, four, five items. That's why it goes according to research. So we can hold uh, five items, and no matter what items are, they they can be a bit complicated, uh, a bit abstract, but these five items are holding in in our brains well. So um, the architecture is needed to deal with these way too complex systems that we cannot fit into our brains. And for our brain, uh, this too complicated, unfortunately, comes way too fast. So we invented layers and layering. And five entities in a layer are perfect because it fits in, in the brains well. But if we'll get five layers and more, that becomes this thing. That's called the bad lasagna, bad lasagna layering, where the, all the layers are mixed and there are too many layers and we have no idea what's going on. All right, so abstraction is a tool and it's not a goal. If someone tells that it's not abstract enough, that's not really a good uh, idea. Abstraction itself should mo not be a goal, never. Abstraction is actually an evil. It's a necessary evil to fit things into our brain, the complicated things, the very, very complicated things. So uh, is there possible to build abstraction without making everything worse? Well, yes. There are two fundamental things uh, invited when uh, the programming was still emerging. It's called cohesion and coupling. Cohesion is uh, how your models, how your classes belong together. So how these are related. So we did this chunking and these chunks of numbers, they, they were belonging together by some kind of other rule. So this cohesion is a good thing, that's why it's green. Uh, maybe it's seen as dark green or something or even uh, black, but that's how it is. So the coupling, that's clearly in red because it's bad. The coupling is when uh, unrelated things are getting into the same group. And that's uh, a very, very bad thing because when you edit this class or this model that is related to things that it should not be related, uh, you uh, can accidentally break very unexpected things. I, are there any simple validation rules or markers we can use to make this vision and coupling right? Well, yes. In year 2000, the Robert Martin, Uncle Bob, invented really uh, simple principles that are sound simple, but not so simple to actually understand and apply. But we'll not talk about this because the solid principles are ov all over the internet and it's not so interesting. You can check it, you can Google it, and we'll talk instead about the packages. So what is a package? A package is a grouped called items, basically that. So usually that's classes, it could be interfaces, it depends on the language of course, it could be some metadata, well whatever. Uh, so uh, I consider a package in this context uh, not only a package that is distributed via the package manager, such as NPM or uh, Packagist or Maven or something like that, but models within the uh, system, within the model lead, uh, then libraries, that's of course they're usually distributed as some kind of a packages, right? And uh, microservices, because these are really related. These uh, follow nearly the same rules as the usual packages. What are the right questions to ask? There are two questions. First is how to design your packages. And second is how to use your packages or dependencies. Does cohesion and coupling apply to these packages? Well, yes. Yes, Th that's fortunate that we can apply still these two principles, but the same as solid was invented to create kind of 
rules we can follow to ensure cohesion and coupling in the code. Uh, there are um, extra markers that are like solid and these are these. So there, there are three markers, three rules for package cohesion, the design. These are RIP, CCP and CRP. I'll explain the abbreviations a bit later. And three rules for the package coupling. That's usage. So let's start with principles. And the first is RIP. REP, yes, reuse release equivalency principles. It sounds like, well, I, I, these were invented by the same guy, the Robert Marty, actually in the same year, but these are not so a, as popular as solid. I don't know why, because these are so, so useful. So the granule of reuse is the granule of release. As always, the Uncle Bob being a bit cryptic, right? What does it mean? Uh, it means that th we should group things and the things that are used by the end user should be together, right? So, uh, for example, this thing follows follows it. So it imports Java I/O bytes alpha stream and I/O exceptions. These are usually used together. So these are in the same namespace, in the same package. Yes, and this is not so good example so we change the package by the type so exception streams go to streams exceptions go to exceptions and it's all mixed and we're importing two packages from two different namespaces that's not as not as good so the second principle is common closure principles classes that are changed together are packages together uh, well they there is a trick because the context of this is uh, changed by whom. Th this is about my maintainer, because these are principles about creating these packages and designing these packages. So classes that are changed together by a maintainer should go into the same package. All right. Uh, good examples are the internet acceleration, so message translation plus uh, command line tool to extract messages from code. These, according to these principles, uh, they may go into a single package. CRP, common reuse principle. Classes that are used together are packaged together. Again, there is a trick about the context. The context here is different. So uh, it's about end user this time. So if classes aren't used by end user separately, they belong to the same package. All right, so the good examples are cache, and its drivers. So cache always used with the driver. So according to this principle, we can uh, package the cache itself and its drivers together. That's something raw, right? Well, yeah, sounds good. Almost. Well, reality is a bit harsh. As I said, it, it, the examples may uh, ring the something in you. Then, <laughs> well, uh, yeah. There is a triangle, the famous triangle, good, fast, and cheap. You can uh, choose only two, and the third will be degraded. And the same thing is about these packaging principles. So uh, we, we can choose two, and we'll get <laughs> very, very interesting side effects. Either we get unneeded releases, if we choose uh, our EP and CCP, or we uh, get changes in many packages if we'll choose RIP and CRP or, or we'll get the little reuser convenience. So yeah, trade-offs again as usual. But well, uh, if you start, just start on all early stages, I recommend to focus on CCP and RIP. So CCP, RIP, that's unneeded releases. Yes, that's not so convenient for the maintainer to prepare all these releases and do it, but if automated, it's not that bad. Okay, so we will get, uh, we are going to the principles of the package uses, usage, and the first one is a cyclic dependencies principle. The dependency graph of packages must have no cycles. Cycles are bad, right? Uh, well, the cycles are causing cascading problems. So if there is a problem in uh, one package, it goes on and goes on and it causes problems in the same package again. Uh, how to check for cycles? Well, you get a paper, 
you draw a directed graph and look at it, right? Well, you can use some automation. Since I'm uh, building a PHP framework that's a specific PHP tool called Clue Graph Composer, it takes the package manager packages and draws a very nice graph like this. So we can see the arrows and see that there is no cycle. The main package is in bold, right? That's a very, very simple stuff. Well, no cycle, all good. Uh, the less dependencies, the simpler everything is. So f as the first thing, you should look into the package dependencies and see if these are really needed. If uh, there are too many dependencies, you'll end up in a, with a NPM package, right? Where the dependencies such as padding things, padding string to the left and uh, well, trim is uh, in the separate package. That's too many things that you can easily implement in the package itself, right? So um, how to break the cycle if you have one? That's not so easy, but doable. Uh, so you uh, should uh, refer to the solid principles and use dependency inversion principle. So you introduce an interface in a separate package and well, uh, making a dependency on the packages you have. And CRP, move the interface into a separate package that's what, what we did. Or you can rethink the whole package, because sometimes it's not really possible to refactor existing one. So, uh, stable dependencies principles. That's another one. It says, like, depend in the direction of stability. And it's, it sounds very obviously, so you, you cannot really build a stable thing on an unstable base, right? It will just collapse. So, uh, well, yes, but how to measure this stability or instability? That's not so easy, but, well, doable. Uh, here's the formula, and I is this level of instability, one is unstable, the value of one is unstable, and zero is totally stable. Usually the, there are no zeros and no ones, uh, in the end, but things happen, yes. So E is afferent, afferent coupling. Uh, so uh, outgoing or fun out. It, it's a number of classes out of the package that the package depends on. So the things use that use your package that will break if you'll change your package. So you will not change your package, unlikely change your package because things will break, right? So it's, it, it's it adds to the stability. And A is afferent coupling, so incoming or then incoupling. It's a number of classes that package depends, uh, that depend on the package, right? Uh, so that adds to instability. And overall, uh, how to increase the stability? That's another principles, SAP, Stable Abstractions Principle, and the package abstractness should increase with stability. Stable packages are abstract, so that's totally abstract is in, in the, the package that contains interface only, right? It's totally stable, it never changes because it breaks like everything, the contract is changed. But uh, the fl flexible packages are usually concrete. The main flexible package is your application itself. Uh, okay. So can we measure this abstractness? Actually, yes. The abstractness, again, is goes from zero to one, and zero is concrete, and one is abstract. And A is a number of abstract entities in a package, such as interfaces, abstract classes, etc. And NC is a number of concrete entities in a package. So that's the classes, the final classes, <laughs> stuff like that. So if we'll um, have ab abstract packages, it they are stable, it's safe to use them, safe to depend on them, and if you have uh, concrete packages, they are unstable. They are not safe to depend on, but they are safe to change. Nothing will break. Well, if you build correctly. 
And there is a th useful uh, thing, visualization of the instability and abstractness. It's called D metric. Uh, so here uh, is the line uh, that uh, well goes from top to bottom. And these circles are models or classes. And the thing is uh, how to read it. So good and bad. These areas are very, very bad. And the further from this green line, the worse. So sometimes zero, zero is OK. Uh, that's uh, totally stable and totally concrete. So examples of these are libraries, like strings, arrays, or stdlib in uh, C. So these are totally, totally concrete. These are not easy to change because these are used too much and now no one will change it. But that's an exception. Usually that uh, goes into the bad things. So this distance from the main line, again, is zero is good, one is bad. Uh, so here uh, zero is on the green line and one goes somewhere in the red area. Okay. So, um, there are tools to draw these. Originally, the uh, graph was made with a JDepend. It's an old tool for Java. Then it was ported for the PHP, PHP Depend, and PHP Metrics. And it's useful to add these to pipeline to generate some images of your classes and just check it. If there are some uh, classes or models in the red areas, that's something to consider for refactoring. Right, so same as solid, these principles and metrics are not dogmas, but tools. Actually, never ever see these principles, see what uh, Uncle Bob says, see what I say, anyone say as dogmas. Never do it. Always question what is said, always try to, um, to ask questions and actually understand what happens. So, uh, Correct design, according to this package's principle, uh, results in an explosive increase in the number of packages. Well, yes, it is very, very scary. When we started doing the version 3 of the framework, uh, the previous version had like 20 packages. And the number started to grow too fast. It was like 50 packages in a week, then 100 packages, and we said, oh, we're doing something wrong many packages but then we uh, reread these principles and we try to actually use these packages in the context of the framework in the context of using these as uh, third-party packages and it actually looks all right it's a bit uh, harder to maintain because you need tools to deal with so many uh, unconnected well virtually unconnected packages to collect the documentation and generate it to do something like that, but it's a correct design. Well, there are trade-offs, of course. You uh, you add some complexity for the maintainer, but the usage is good, and maintaining these is good once these are released for the first time. So uh, these principles they are there to keep you away from either left bad or Monolith. Monolith where everything is a single package and everything is interconnected. I, I mean the bad monolith. Really bad thing when the coupling is skyrocketing and you just edit one class and everything breaks in like five places at the same time and you, you just, yeah, it's end of life, right? Everything broken, production is bleh bad and uh, on the other side of the coin there is a left pad you know the, his the story of the left pad maybe not so the left pad is uh, a JavaScript NPM package that does one thing it takes a string takes a length and pads it from the left with the character specified that's it it does just that so this left pa package as usually is done in the JavaScript world, was used everywhere. Everywhere, in the, in the NPM itself, in the main the frameworks, 
in the other small packages, just everywhere. And one day, the maintainer of this left pad was in a very, very bad mood. So he just went there and deleted it. And the whole ecosystem collapsed. The NPM collapsed, the main frameworks collapsed, everything was just blown. That's it. So yeah, uh, this is very bad. The, the NPM fixed it. They make these packages undeletable. <laughs> if something depends uh, on your packages, on your package too much, then it, it cannot be deleted. But yeah, it's like a so-so fix. In the first place, that's uh, not really a stable package. It's not an abstraction. It's very concrete, and it depends on just one person, so it cannot be really considered stable. So the JavaScript infrastructure was built on a very unstable base, and well, they paid for it. In a sh well, it was really short outage. They sorted it uh, in a day, but it was scary. So. These tools and principles should help you produce code that breaks less, I hope. And that's it. That's questions time. You can scan the QR code and write questions there, or you can raise your hands and ask questions. Here are some contexts and references. The slides will be available, so these uh, colored links are clickable. and well, yeah, you can write me to the Telegram. Here's a blog link and an email. Don't hesitate to. Thanks. Thank you very much. Let's round of applause for our speaker. <laughs> Don't forget to rate the talk. There is a link for the rating system and the link for our uh, Telegram chat where you can ask a question. So I see some hands. Please, we have uh, let's the person on the right. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, how do you divide uh, layers inside package? For example, we have application layer or mm -hmm. layers, uh, like some kind of li repository layer, or yeah. how do you divide it? So um, that depends on what package does. There are two types of uh, these packages. First is utilitary packages, the service packages. These are usually divided by type, and that's okay. There is no domain logic. It's like, well, a thing that sends SMS. So a package with an interface for that and some implementations, that's, well, quite obvious, quite easy, right? And uh, there are uh, packages that are actually models within our system. And personally, I prefer to use the vertical slices by the domain design. Uh, there are the term bounded context, that's uh, one domain area that you implement, and you take everything there and get it from the your uh, framework, from something like that, and not creating namespaces by type. So it's not, not like controllers, models, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like uh, the namespace resembles the domain models, the domain layer. And inside, you create uh, what package needs. So the models, controllers, etc. I do it like that, and it, it really works. The um, mm, well, the rule, the check, you can check yourself by trying to delete this uh, package in the less possible am uh, amount of steps. So if it's deletable in one step, like just uh, get to the directory, delete it, and it's gone, then it's fine. If you have to search all your project for the leftovers, then something is wrong. I have a question here. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I have a question not about the design, but about right. how to work with team, uh, how to plan the design, how to plan the architecture to avoid unnecessary refactoring in the future. Maybe you have some best practices. All right. Well. First of all, you cannot avoid refactoring. You cannot. Because the business changes. It, it al always evolves and changes, and the business rule change, and there are corrections, there are bugs, there are something you cannot really predict. So in my experience, you design ahead, but uh, not very much. So you design ahead what really 
is unable to change and what is really able to change. For example, this SMS gate, there are business reasons why it may be switched to another SMS gate. So the pricing may go up, uh, the stability may go down, so you have to replace it, right? So you need an interface there, that, that, that's for sure. Another thing is like uh, database, right? So you can use ORM, but that makes little sense because you will, well, accept some cases. If you're uh, building a CMS or something that is used in an unpredictable environment where the, any database could be used, then the ORM is a perfect thing. If you're building the specific project and you're using like PostgreSQL, it's very, very unlikely that you will change that to the MySQL in the future. Well, things happen, of course, but it, it, it is very unlikely. So this thing is not too abstract. I, I, you can use just repositories and do some uh, methods for concrete queries. You can replace it later if needed, but you, you don't need ORM in this case. So plan ahead, and when you are not certain, when you don't know, no, have no idea if it's going to be replaced or not, and, it, and if you cannot really decide on the final design, do an interface. Because if you'll postpone this design decision, by the time you'll have more information to make the decision correct. If you'll make decision without the much information, you'll make a mistake. Anyone else? No? Yes. Here. Gentleman of the Hi, thank you for speak. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, you say that uh, to avoiding cycling, we can use a dependency inversion uh, from solid principles and yeah. also extract the uh, package interfaces into a separate package. Mm -hmm. uh, Correct. Uh, I didn't catch uh, right, I think. All right. So, uh, what do you mean to extract? interfaces so uh, if, if there, the, there is a direct dependency so one package uses another and uh, there is a circle in the sub dependencies you can uh, well first of all you introduce an interface right so y it doesn't use the package directly but it uses interface then you extract it so the package uh, becomes independent on the cr concrete dependency it depends on the interface and this concrete dependency goes up to the package's hierarchy. Itself, it does not depend on the implementation anymore. It depends on the abstraction. That's it. And in your application, you'll maybe have a cycle, but that's a different problem. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, thank you. <coughs> Uh, you said about uh, visualization tool for cycling, for uh, for cycling between models. Oh yeah. Uh, is this uh, package uh, applicable for Python, for example, or only for? These PHP? principles are applicable to any language, any framework, and Python packages are no exception. Uh, yes, I said I said about uh, visualization tool. Uh, ah, visualization yes. tools. Well. I think there should be something for Python because the original JDepend for Java was quite popular and it was ported over to many, many languages. But I'm not a Python expert, so I, I have no idea it was, if it was ported to Python. But, well, almost everything was ported to Python, so I think you'll find it. I can add to that that uh, the dependency graph is just a SQL graph and you can use any kind of software that will uh, just draw this kind yeah, of Yeah, you, you have to program something to get the graph. Well, we're this developers. Way, but, uh, that's, well, we as lazy developers should use ready-to-use tools, right? Yes. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Did you run this... Uh, like stability ratings and uh, the second one rating across the E framework, the second and the third one. Uh, and what are yes. the numbers? Numbers. Okay, uh, the, the, I, I can't really recall the numbers. And in the second version of the framework, it wasn't good. I can say it, it wasn't really good because uh, 
well the coupling level is very high there so the these red areas were full of classes and also there is a uh, uh, well the, the dependency injection could be used but the uh, repository pattern when where, where you s get services from a single tone is used all over the framework itself so that that's why the dependencies are very hard in the E2 and the red area is full. E2 is were very very different. So uh, there are some libraries that are zero zero, so stable stable things that are used directly, like uh, the standard libraries or something. But that's I think the only thing that goes into the red area. The rest is uh, goes on the main line. So package-wise, it's much more correct than the E2. Uh, and what was your approach to that? So you have uh, E2, yes, and then you decided to make E3. Yeah. Uh, did you like run the test across E2? Uh, no, 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 the no, results not really. Not really. The, the E2 had uh, some fundamental. Uh, design things that were preventing us from doing the E3 properly. That's why it was written from scratch, taking just ideas and not the actual code. So they, these uh, things were like the using the inheritance a lot. So there was thing like base object that everything was inherited from that and it was changing the behavior of the base PHP objects. <laughs> yeah, that was really funny. Uh, uh, it was quite cool since the error reporting was a bit better, but the price for that was quite huge. So instead of being the framework that is integrated with the community package as well, it was like uh, the its own world with the lots of wrappers around everything that is in the clear net. So yeah, something like that. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? We have a special gift for a best question asked. I'd like to remind. Yes, gentleman over there. Hi. Uh, Hello. Thank you for your speech. Uh, and one question about E3. Uh, yeah. Why choose E3 if Symfony is already exists? Well, that's because a good question. Because uh, packages <laughs> is already uh, designed and, and well designed. Mm, they are, they are, they are okay. Well, th they have some issues. Uh, for example, they are not adhering to the PSR 7, the standard for request response that many external tools and uh, packages adhere to. They don't have the middleware in the same way. Uh, so it's not truly easy to use it for with the alternative runners, with the ready-to-use middlewares. And design-wise, uh, I don't like really the compiling stuff in the PHP and their container is compiled. So what, what is actually run in the runtime is not what you've written. And as long as it works, it's fine. But when it like breaks and there are mistakes and the compiling passes, well, you're in trouble. It's very, very hard to debug. So we uh, actually did a framework that is uh, very, very easy to debug that has um, not that many layers that has the PHP doc everywhere so it's, it's explained the errors are very very uh, friendly <laughs> there is a actually an interface called the friendly exception when the exception comes uh, there, there could be a description on how to fix it maybe we'll uh, work a bit more and it will fix itself <laughs> we'll see so yeah uh, other than that, they're, uh, well, quite similar, but the flavor is different. Flavor is really different. The approach, the packages, the code coverage, we have uh, like 100% code coverage, 100% mutation testing with every package. Well, I know that's probably too much, but we do it. Well, it takes a long time, but in the end, it will be a really, really solid code. Gentleman to the right. 
Uh, did, did you try to find a correlation between these technical metrics and business metrics of applications? Mm, technical metrics and business metrics. I mean, uh, is it true that if we have, uh, for example, uh, great, uh, for example, D metrics or something like that, yeah. it means that uh, we will have more successful ah, no, 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 in no, terms no, of no. business? No. Well, uh, all, all our technical stuff is about technical stuff. It doesn't affect business in the short term. Well, business won't start making more money just because we have a great D metrics or we because we're following solid. Well, the business will uh, be successful if the business people are doing good and the tech people are doing enough. So. I've seen a very, very successful projects that were totally shitty inside, like rah, totally shitty. And the thing is that in the long term that matters, in the long term that matters a lot, because if you, if you have a shitty code, if you have tons of tech debt you never fix, then with time it will be more and more complicated to fix bugs and introduce new features it will be it will take more and more time more and more time and in the end you won't be able to add anything at all without breaking all this stuff so that's why these d metrics matter that's why the solid matters that's why we have to uh, take like 30 percent of our time in a sprint and allocate it to cleaning up technical debt and well Actually, uh, uh, with time, I realized that we should allocate this 30% of time w without even asking the business. We are doing our tech stuff, we're doing it with a certain pace, and, well, there is some time we always take for taking care of our tech debt. Gentlemen in the back. Thank you, uh, Tema Gavrichenko of servers.com. Uh, uh, I want uh, kind of to add to the response to the previous question. All right. So actually, there is a business metric which gets affected by oh. uh, bad packaging and bad uh, architectural principles. It gets affected in two ways, and I'm talking about time to market of new features. Uh, because first, uh, with bad architecture, it takes more time for you to develop the code. Secondly, it takes more time for you to do a proper uh, uh, quality uh, assurance. So basically, uh, time to market could grow some, you know, I don't know, two, three times, and this is not what the business would want. That's not direct correlation, I think, because, uh, well, it is there, but it, 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 it is visible with time. It's not visible immediately. So you yep. do code, instantly, everything yes. works, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, then, oh, we cannot add new features. That's it. Very dangerous stuff. Do we have any more questions? No? No, I see no questions. So, the best question, Alexander, it's your job to choose. Uh, I very like the last question about the technical debt and business metrics and the relation of that. So the gentleman to the right, yeah, if I'm correct, yeah, yeah. Somewhere, gets somewhere there. I don't see him because there are lights. Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct. So applause, please. Congrats. And let's thank our speaker for a lovely talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Спасибо, Шнурокалицун.